Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to start our seminar today. So to, today our speaker is uh, Yang Mei Park. Um, he's a new faculty at CMU. Um, actually, Yang Mei and I started at the same same uh, academic year at CMU as faculty. Uh, Yang Mei got his PhD in mechanical engineering at Stanford. Um, he actually worked with Mark Petkowski. Mm -hmm. So if you've taken um, you know, manipulation classes, um, you know about um, the Petkowski katana. Um, and after after Stanford, um, I was at uh, the Harvard. full name is Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering um, at Harvard. So he was there for about three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, he came to CMU after that. So he's been doing a lot of cool work in soft robotics. Um, I think you could you know from the fact that his work was kind of a cover story for the uh, IEEE journal in sensors, yeah. sensor journals. Um, it seems like he's been getting a lot of visibility for his research. So he'll be talking about that um, today. So we're very glad to have you on the here. And thank you very much. And please take it away. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, OK, so thanks for the invitation. I'm very excited to give a talk here. When I was a PhD, uh, one day, my advisor told me, I'm going to CMU to give a talk in RI seminar series. And I thought, oh, that is really nice. And then I moved to Harvard for a postdoc. And then another day, my postdoc supervisor, advisor, also told me, I'm going to CMU to give a talk in RI seminar series. So I was wondering, oh, when can I, when can I give a talk in RI seminar series? And then, uh, yeah, today is that. <laughs> OK, great. So uh, the topic I'm going to talk about is soft robotics, uh, which means uh, making uh, robots or sensors, actuators, whatever, with using soft materials. Uh, traditionally, robots were made with metals and really rigid frame structures. Uh, but the trends are changing. And then in the future, the robots will be able to interact with human uh, more and more. And then we will be able to use robots in our daily life. And then the metal robots and also rigid robots will not be really safe and uh, human friendly. So people are doing a lot of research on soft robotics. So these are some examples of soft robots. There are some crawling robots like this, and then also uh, mesh worm type robot, grippers, and also inflatable robot developed in CMU, and also uh, some kind of uh, jamming skin uh, robots. So these are really great, but uh, there are no really uh, great uh, definition of soft robots and also how we can design and how we can build. So today I'm going to talk about how to design and uh, manufacture this kind of uh, complicated structures and use using soft materials as an actuators and sensors. So there are three main challenges in soft robotics. First, uh, design of the soft structures. So there are no conventional mechanical joints and fit fasteners like uh, bolts and nuts and these joints. So we cannot really use this kind of parts, and then, but we have to design our robots to move and uh, do some uh, desired tasks. And the second challenge is manufacturing. So we use a certain uh, materials, but we cannot really use a uh, traditional machine process because the soft materials cannot be machined using uh, traditional machines. So there is a challenge. And then once we overcome these two challenges, there is another challenge in integration, like a soft system. We have to integrate soft parts to make the real uh, robotic system. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, soft sensors first, and then soft actuators and soft robots. So let me start with soft sensors. The background of soft sensor research is body motion sensing. So people are. Uh, trying to detect body motions in three-dimensional in three dimension, in dimension space. So this is really famous system, uh, optical system. Uh, the company name is Bicom. So they use multiple cameras in the lab. And then that camera detects the reflectors on the body. Then you uh, can three-dimensional body shapes and motion. But this is great. And this is really uh, famous and popularly used in entertainment in industries and also movie industries. But the problem is you cannot really go outside with this system because you always have to have multiple cameras. So people developed some other system 
uh, which use the inertial measurement units, uh, IMU. IMU is composed of a magnetometer, gyro, and also accelerometer. And then you can put each IMU on your body segments, uh, multiple IMUs on your body segments. And then when you move around, you can detect the uh, orientation of each segment. So this is great. But the problem is, since the IMU, you have to attach your body. So when you move around, it also uh, some, sometimes it slips. It pr that provides some errors. And also, it requires a lot of uh, heavy uh, computations and calculations. So it consumes a relatively high power. So we wanted to develop really low cost and low power, but really easily wearable, and it doesn't really bother your uh, body motion, existing body motions. So we looked, at, we, looked, we looked at different options, and we found a very interesting material called uh, liquid metal, E-gain, which is alloy between gallium and indium. But this alloy maintains uh, liquid state at room, tem room temperature. So you can find uh, this video in YouTube. Uh, this is really uh, easy to find. And this material has a high uh, surface tension, but because this is metal, it has also electrically highly conductive. So the idea here is in making really thin elastomer layer like this, and then make a microchannel embedded inside of elastomer layer. And you can fill this microchannel with this liquid metal. Now you have a completely soft wire. Even though you stretch or flex, the metal inside is liquid, so it always maintains the continuous foam. So you don't break conductivity. Then you have a very interesting effect. So when you compress the top surface, you deform microchannel embedded in this elastomer, and then you decrease the cross-sectional area of the microchannel, which increases the electrical resistance based on this really simple and very famous law, uh, resistance law. And now, when you stretch this material, you elongate the length of the material, microchannel, and then that also increases the electrical resistance. So by incorporating uh, geometries and mechanical properties of these uh, structures uh, in this uh, resistance law, we can uh, develop uh, the analytical models like this. And then we can also build our own sensors. So when you compress the surface, uh, and then you deform the microchannel, and in it increases electrical resistance. And now, when you stretch, uh, it also increases electrical resistance. So you can use this as a pressure sensor and uh, strain sensor. So we got great results, and we published this paper, uh, published the paper, and also we uh, have a patent on this technology. But the next question we had is whether you compress or stretch, you always increase the electrical resistance. So if you really want to make it wearable, and then you move around, sometimes it stretches, sometimes it, uh, you make contact. So you don't really know what kind of stimulus you are getting. So the next. Uh, the solution here is having multi-layered structure for multimodal sensing. So you can have multi-axis strain sensors and also pressure sensors. You can stack up all these together. So the design is uh, simple, but here the challenge is if you make individual, sen individual sensors and just to stack up together, and then you, the thickness is getting uh, higher and higher. And also you have to inject liquid metal individually each time. So that makes it, your fabrication process complicated. So we developed our own uh, novel fabrication process uh, like this. We make uh, 3D printed mold like this using uh, rigid plastics, and then we can have each layers. Now you can pour liquid polymer in this mold. When it cures, you can remove the mold, and it has multiple features. So you have micro channels, injection port, and also alignment to hole. And this interconnect connects to the next level of the circuit. So when you bond all the cure, cured layers like this, you will have a complete prototype, complete structure. And then you can inject liquid metal inside of this uh, circuit. So only one injection makes the whole connection. And now you can connect the signal wire. And then you can have a complete prototype like this. And the next slide it shows the E-gain injection process, the liquid metal injection process. So you have a bottom layer, second layer, on top of the bottom layer, and then the top layer. And these layers are connected through this small interconnect. And now this is a real-time video. I'm injecting the bottom layer first. At the end of the bottom layer, it goes to the second layer through this interconnect.
the sensor size here is uh, one inch by one inch, and the microchannel size uh, in the cross section is about 200 micron by 200 micron. So now, at the end of the second layer, it goes to the third layer. Even though the sensor size is just an inch by inch, if you elongate this microchannel because of really thin and uh, a lot of patterns, if you elongate this microchannel to a straight line, it is almost two meter. But it takes only one minute to fill all these channels. Okay, now you have a complete prototype, and then let's see uh, the prototype more in detail. So you have front side and back side, and then here you can see three layers are not interfering each other, but they are connected only through these two interconnects. What's great about this de design is this is uh, no more than just three variable registers connected in series. So if you just flow constant current, and then you can easily measure the regis resistance change of each sensors. And now we have uh, sensor calibration result, we stretch it in x-axis and y-axis and also we compressed uh, in z-axis. And now the sensor gives uh, three different signals and then different patterns. Yeah. yeah. So when you have all, everything all intertwined like that, is there no uh, interference like? Uh, there is coupling, yeah. Generating like an induct, as an inductor or you're creating a magnetic field, right, when you have... Oh, right, yeah, yeah. So that is possible, but we are flowing really, really small current. Uh, so we didn't uh, get any interference, a lot of interference, uh, so in our application. So we have three uh, calibration results, and then when you connect this computer based on this calibration result, we can construct a real-time sensing system. So this is the actual uh, device, and... This is the sensing element. You can stretch and flex so you don't break. The material itself can be stretched like up to a few hundred percent easily. Now, when you connect to your computer, you can have real-time sensing capability. So you can stretch in x-axis. It knows the direction and it knows the magnitude. And when you change the direction, it also knows the uh, different direction and magnitude. And you can compress the top surface and then it also increase, uh, it shows the uh, pressure sensing capability. So we published this uh, work in IEEE Sensors Journal and then it was cover article and also it was selected as the best paper of 2012. So we have this great sensor, but the next question is, uh, we can detect the multi-axis strain and normal force, but can we even detect the shear force? So we, we started a, a little bit different design. So instead of having multi-layered structure, we can have multiple channels in a single layer, and then we can embed a rigid force post, the micro, micro scale rigid force post on top. But now, when you compress the top surface, uh, these two channels are deformed uh, pre pretty much the same. But if you apply show first, this force post rotates, and then this microchannel is deformed more than the other. So you can tell the difference uh, based on this signal difference. So this is some examples of microchannel patterns, and then you can have basically three channels at minimum, but you can increase the uh, number of channels to increase the spatial resolution. And the fabrication process is pretty much the same as the uh, previous <coughs> method, and except uh, the last step. So here we embed the first post at the end. And now we have a complete prototype, and then we can do the same calibration uh, experiments. We can compress the top surface with normal force, x axis shear force, and y axis shear force. And based on this calibration result, we can have a real time sensing system uh, the same way. So the material is the same. Here uh, we dyed with uh, just blue pigments. So when you compress the top surface, it knows the direction and also magnitude. And you can slide your finger to different directions. OK, so. Uh, yeah, uh, so based on this uh, design and fabrication principles, uh, we can have a lot more different types of uh, uh, 
uh, sensors. We can have a stretchable keypad and curvature sensors and also some uh, finger, finger joint sensors. And this one is interesting. This one is uh, because we replaced the liquid metal with ionic solution here. So the reason we used ionic solution is to increase the biocompatibility. If we want to build some kind of implantable device with this material, the liquid metal we used is non-toxic, but you don't want to use it inside of your body. But saline solution is really safe to use. And also, the resistance change in this sensor side and also this wire, which is uh, made of liquid metal, we used is really, really different. So even though there is some resistance change in this wire side, it, we, we can still tell the, sensor, uh, the stretchiness of the sensors. Okay, so uh, we are still uh, working on developing different types of sensors, and, but we are also interested in uh, uh, improving the sensor signals. So when you make a sensor, so the sensor response is, is not always perfect and linear. So we always have some uh, nonlinearity and also uh, noise. But you can use, use uh, filtering and some uh, amplification and whatever filtering um, schemes after uh, you're getting the sensor signals. But we are also interested in improving the sensor signal before going to that stage in low level, in mechanical design. So here, this is conventional microchannels, uh, square shape. And here, as you can see, the response is really uh, nonlinear and also it shows a high hysteresis. So if, but we have some ideas of changing the microchannels, the cross-sectional shape, and then to improve the uh, response. So we try the different uh, channel shapes. So cross-section of like, uh, a uh, semicircle on top of a square, triangle, concave triangle. And then we found that concave triangle shows a much better response than a tra traditional uh, square shape. So it significantly reduces the hysteresis and also it slightly improves the uh, linearity. So we can have all analytical models and also simulations. So we got uh, this results and it was really exciting. But here the limitation is you have to make this complicated mold. So for square shape, you can simply use a 3D printer, but in this mode, you have to use a micro milling machine if you want to make uh, small channels. So that uh, costs a lot and also that uh, makes the process complicated. So the next step we did is looking at the same square shape channel, but embedding solid uh, particles inside of the micro channel. Then it shows a pretty similar uh, response improvement like this. So we did some experiments here. Oops. Yeah, so we did some experiment. So in this experiment, we made a microchannel with square shape, and then we embedded a single solid bead in one row. And then we increased the width of the microchannel to uh, one millimeter, and then we embedded uh, two micro beads in uh, one section. So you have, if you see the cross section of this microchannel, you have only one bead embedded, and two beads embedded in this microchannel. And now we did a uh, simulation using Abacus, and then the simulation result shows the empty channel shows nonlinearity, and the bit embedded channel shows a little bit uh, improved linearity. And this is two bit case. And the experiment shows uh, pretty much similar results. So with empty channel, it shows a really high nonlinearity, but we can improve the linearity. And also we can improve the minimum detectable range of the pressure. So we are keep working on this uh, type of uh, improvement. And then currently, we are working on developing analytical models and also uh, developing more uh, simulation results. OK? So uh, next topic I'm going to talk about is soft actuators. So in, the, in, in addition to sensing, I'm also interested in building actuators using soft materials. So the first actuator we are focused on is McKibble muscle. This is a really famous muscle. When you apply compressed air inside of this air chamber, it inflates in radial direction, but it contracts in axial direction. So this is really famous, but not very, very popular. 
So to uh, figure out the uh, principles, uh, we identify the key components of these muscles, and then we just built our own miniature muscles uh, using very cheap materials, uh, nylon mesh and rubber tube. And then it works great. And then we use this muscle for uh, wearable devices. I'm going to talk about uh, these wearable devices in the later. But this is great, but because of the friction, mesh and rubber, and also mesh itself, so it doesn't create very, very smooth motion. And also it is activated uh, rel rel with relatively high uh, air pressure. So inspired from muscle fibers, in, our, in human muscle or animal muscles. Like this is straight patterns of muscle fibers. We directly embedded yellow capillary fibers in the elastomer tube. So here, this is just one piece, there's no rubbing part. But capillary fiber is really, really flexible, but it's not stretchable. So when you inflate, it makes round shape. But because of the constraint length of the capillary shape, it makes contraction. So we were able to build this kind of muscle. So this is great. And uh, we were able to actuate much with much lower air pressure. And also, uh, it created smooth motion. And then we were really excited about this muscle. But after that, we found this. More than 50 years ago, yeah. someone already proposed this, uh, exactly the same design. So, we are a little bit disappointed, but we started to think uh, differently. So what is really the limitation of a pneumatic muscle? Why pneumatic muscles are really famous but not very popular? The, one of the biggest reasons is nonlinearity in behavior. So different from electrical motors, if you apply compressed air, the behavior is really, really nonlinear. So we cannot really predict how it will behave, and it, it is really hard to control with analytical models. So people add more sensors and sensors externally. That makes the mechanical system much more complicated and bulky. So then, do we, so that is uh, the main problem. But if you look at our biological muscles, our muscles are nonlinear too. But we don't have any problems. Why can we uh, control our muscles really well? Because we have a very interesting organs, Golgi tendon organ and muscle spindles. And muscle spindle detects contraction of the muscle. So this is more like a position sensor. And also, Golgi tendon organ detects tension of the muscle. So that is more like a force sensor. So we have hundreds of muscles, but each muscle has this type of uh, position sensor and force sensors. So with these muscles, even though you close your eyes, when you move your arm, you know how much you are moving. And also, you know how much force you are applying. So uh, if we can have this capability with pneumatic muscles, that would be really, really uh, practical and useful. So we started designing new muscles. So layer two is the same as the previous muscle. Uh, yellow lines are capillary fibers embedded in the elastomer tube. But we added two more layers, layer one and layer three. In layer one and two, uh, three, we made helical microchannels. And this microchannel is filled with liquid matter. So now, when you apply compressed air, it contracts, but it, uh, it inflates in radial direction. So these microchannels are also expanded, which increases electrical resistance. So we can easily detect how much it is inflated. That is directly converted to the contraction of the muscle, which is positions. But now, when you fix these two ends, but further increase the internal pressure, this inner layer is still pushed out, but that is constrained by these uh, capillary fibers and compressed. Now, this inner microchannel in the inner layer increased uh, electrical resistance further a lot more. So the outer microchannel can be used as a position sensing, and inner layer is used for uh, force sensing. So we have really complicated this complicated structure. The next question is how to build this structure. So we built, uh, we developed our own fabrication process. We have outer mold and inner mold, and then we align the capillary fibers in the straight way. And we can put in this gap. That makes a tube with embedded capillary fibers. Now, when you remove the outer mold, we wrap this secured tube with very low friction, uh, thin microfibers. Micro 
Now we pour again and we cure again. Then when you remove the mold, you can pull these microfibers out of the structure that leaves a helical trace inside, uh, which can be used as a, as a helical microchannel. And the video shows how to remove uh, the microchannel. So when you pull the microfiber, it leaves the helical microchannel inside. And when you zoom in, you have yellow Kevlar fibers and one helical microchannel is on top of Kevlar fiber and the other microchannel under the Kev uh, Kevlar fiber. And this is the uh, video of injection of a liquid metal. So when you inject, I'm going to play again, this is really fast. So when you inject, it fills all the microchannels. So we were able to build these uh, pneumatic muscles with embedded sensing capability. But now we have a problem of a complicated fabrication process. Even though we developed our own fabrication processes, the process here is really complicated. And also it depends on uh, your hand skill. So, uh, so it was really difficult to standardize the quality of this uh, product. So then we need to either redesign our uh, device or fabrication process. So here we start thinking about two-dimensional two dimension simplification. So we have a three-dimensional tubular shape, but we, have a, we can make two-dimensional flat muscles with uh, sensors embedded. So when you transfer from 3D to 2D, you have to keep air chamber, Kevlar fiber, and microchannels all the time. So we started to design our air chambers. The conventional air chamber is something like this. You can use just molding and casting, and then you can have air chamber embedded in the uh, elastomer layer. But this volume is kind of waste, because when you are not using, you still have, we always have the volume, and then that doesn't make the device really thin. So we developed our own uh, design, which is called the zero volume air chamber. Here, the blue line is not bounded area. So it is completely collapsed when you are not using it. So if you want to build some kind of a wearable device with this actuator, and this would be really useful. But when you apply comp compressed air inside of this area, that inflates, it works as a, a air chamber, like previous uh, design. So this is a fabrication process. First, we have to make a mold and then pour liquid polymer, and then we add a negative mask, and now we spray pattern release. This pattern release prohibits bonding of la uh, cured layers of polymer. When you remove the mold, you have a pattern release in the middle, and then you, pour, you add another wall and pour liquid polymer again. Now, when it cures, you have unbonded area, which is uh, zero volume air chamber. You can add uh, Kevlar fibers in this process. And now, we have another option. Uh, we have auto mold and liquid polymer, but instead of a negative mask, we can put positive mask. And instead of a pattern release, we can spin coat the same liquid polymer on top of this surface. Now, when you remove this mask, you have spin coated material only outside. And then you can put another bond, uh, cured layer on top of this cured bottom layer. Now you can have unbonded area, which is zero volume air chamber. So using this fabrication process, we made a, a pneumatic artificial muscle, which is really flat. The thing is, is about uh, three millimeter. When you apply uh, 15 PSI, the maximum contraction is about 25%. You can make uh, multiple cells, so you can have, have like, uh, increased displacement. You can have multiple cells, cells in parallel to increase the contraction force. Okay, now we have the muscle and then this is not a very simple fabrication, but uh, now we have to add uh, sensor layers, sensors. So in the cylindrical shape, we have one sensor below the Kevlar fiber and on the other sensor on top of uh, Kevlar fiber. So that is a really complicated structure. So it is really hard to build even though it is two dimension. But if we look at biological skin and muscle structure here, as you can see here, there are a lot of difficult words. You don't have to remember uh, all this, and then, yeah, you don't have to remember all this. But interesting thing here is, 
our skin muscle structure is layered by layer, and each layer has its own function and its own component and different materials. So you have actuation layer deep inside the muscle, and then you have fat layer which co co contains uh, uh, blood vessels, and then you can have epidermis and dermis uh, that contains the uh, sensors. So we can divide our structure really layer by layer with functionality and also uh, materials and components. We can build easily uh, our structure like this. So using this structure, we can have a complete prototype. Okay, so yeah. So this is really similar to previous uh, manufacturing process to build the micro robots. Uh, in this process, uh, they use a flexible material and rigid material and they provide some uh, flexible areas. So this is not really for the soft robots, but it's a flexible, uh, foldable robots. So we are kind of using the same uh, concept, but we are expanding this manufacturing method concept to soft materials and soft structures. So using this fabrication process, we built our own muscle like this. You have micro channels outside of the Kevlar fiber in the front side, and then you have another micro channel embedded under the Kevlar fiber in the back side. Between these micro channels and Kevlar's front and back, you have a zero volume air chamber embedded. And now when you inflate these uh, muscles, you have a contraction effect, and then these micro channels can be uh, expanded. Now, we want you to know how well it works as a sensor. So, we did two tests, the position sensing test and uh, force, sense, force sense test. So now you can see you have zero volume air chamber and then Kevlar fibers and sensor one is embedded outside of the Kevlar fiber and sensor two is embedded inside of the Kevlar fiber. And we applied uh, compressed air in the air chamber and you can see the resistance, resistance change of sensor one. So when you contract, it makes increased resistance, and then you can easily detect how much it is contracted. And now, for the experiment, uh, we measure the pressure, and then we also measure the displacement, how much it is contracting. So this is supposed to be millimeter is typo. And when you apply uh, up to 11 psi, the displacement increases up to like a four millimeter in nonlinear way. But if you measure the sensor signals, of two sensors, and they're really linear, and then they increase pretty much the same, because they are expanding in the same manner. But if we fix two ends, and then if we apply compressed air inside, that doesn't really change the geometry, but that increases the elect uh, internal pressure of the air chamber. So this is the sensor signal from sensor two. So now here we have contraction force increased when you apply force, and then resistance of sensor two also in increases. You can notice the muscle is expanding a little bit because it is made of elastomer, even though you don't allow contraction. So now let's see, let's see the data. If you apply, if you increase the pressure from zero to 11 PSI, then force increases. And now when you measure the sensor signals of sensor one and sensor two, sensor one really slightly uh, increases because of that uh, inflation, a little bit of inflation. But sensor two is compressed by this Kevlar fiber and then this increases uh, much more. So by differentiating these signals, we can tell how much force is applied, up, uh, applying and also how much contraction is making. So we are using strain sensing effect in sensor one, but we are using pressure sensing and strain sensing effect of, in sensor two. So as an ongoing work, uh, even though the current two-dimensional muscle is great, but it also has uh, some limitation or weak point. Because it's not, it's not symmetric, it may some kind of weak point. So the end of the muscle has high, high stress concentration, and then when you inflate multiple times and when you uh, apply high compressed air, sometimes it uh, delaminates. So, Still, it is useful to have a symmetric three-dimensional muscles. So, so, but this is not like we are giving up. This is a kind of, uh, we are still improving the material and process. But it is also worth to explore how to automate these uh, three-dimensional uh, structures. So we are building this machine and that makes, that helps us to uh, easily uh, helical microchannels, and this is some preliminary uh, experimental results. 
Okay, so now we talked about sensors and actuators, and now we're going to move to soft robots. So by using our soft sensors and actuators, we can have integrated system soft robots. The first project we had is an active soft orthotic device. The background here is dropout problem. Dropout is a symptom uh, commonly found in uh, stroke neuromuscular disorders like uh, stroke patients and uh, cerebral palsy patients. Here, this kid has a dropout problem on her right foot, right ankle. So since the damage between your brain, and because of the damage between your brain and your muscle, sometimes you cannot control your uh, specific muscles. So that comes to anterior muscle of your lower leg. So that makes it really hard to lift up your foot. So they cannot make dorsiflexion, active dorsiflexion. Because of that problems, uh, the deformity gets uh, worse and worse. And also it makes really uh, abnormal gait. So typical solution of this problem is wearing this uh, passive brace that fixes your joint angle to uh, 90 degree. But the problem of this device is muscle atrophy and dependence. So the more you use this device, the more dependent on the device you will be. But if uh, neuromuscular disorder pa patients uh, uh, do a lot of exercise and re rehabilitation, there is a high chance of uh, restoring your nerve system. But if you use this device, uh, you lose that kind of chance. So people add active elements in this kind of device, uh, like this. You can add some motor and also pneumatic actuators. So you can actuate this device uh, only when needed. But the limitation here is uh, they consider ankle joint as a really simple mechanical pin joint. But our ankle is much more complicated. We have three-dimensional motions. So we wanted to allow that three-dimensional motions but still have active elements in this device. So to design our device, we looked at anatomy first of our lower leg, how our ankle works. And then we found it is too much complicated. <laughs> But we don't have to follow all these, uh, and then it is impossible to copy these kind of structures. So we identified uh, three major muscles to make a dorsiflexion. Tibialis anterior runs down, and then the tendon of tibialis anterior is anchored inside of your foot. And extensor dig digitum longus uh, runs down, and then it is split to multiple places uh, of your toe. And peroneus tertius is running down, and it is anchored outside of the foot. So by using the combination of these muscles, you can make different motions, so dorsiflexion and inversion and eversion. So maybe we can have this kind of structures outside of the leg. So we started to have a non-stretchable, flex but flexible knee brace and ankle brace. And we can install our uh, artificial muscles outside of these uh, braces. And then we can have some bio, uh, almost similar structures like this. And now we can add the soft sensors on the ankle to detect the joint angle. Based on this, this design, we built our system like this. We use the commercial pneumatic muscles manufactured by Fasto. And we have a bio-inspired tendon ligament system. The tendons are running down and anchored to different locations, which is really similar to our own tendons. And also, that should be constrained by the artificial ligaments. And we have three muscles at the front side and big, one big muscle uh, at the back side. So you can make active dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And now for the sensing, you have a hypoelastic strain sensor on your joint angle. So when you move your ankle, it stretches and uh, compressed. So you can detect the resistance change. And we have control hardware. Uh, we use very small pneumatic valves like this. And the video shows uh, how it works, uh, the device. So this is commercial uh, pneumatic muscle. When we had this project, we didn't develop our own muscles, so we just bought our, uh, these muscles. And this is the soft sensor we developed. When you integrate to a uh, human leg, you can have active dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. This is actually human leg, actually my leg. <laughs> and then during this dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, you can use this strain sensor to detect the joint angles. Now, you can even have medial lateral motions uh, 
by actuating different muscles at different timing. Okay, so we did a lot of characterization experiments uh, like uh, sensors and actuators. Uh, and then we implemented different pulse width modulation to control our muscles uh, proportionally. And we also did feedback control, like this. So we applied the sinusoidal waves, and then it shows a pretty matching uh, output. And also we applied the actual uh, walking trajectory as an input, and then it shows uh, somewhat following uh, in the experiment. So we had with this result and we published the paper, but we found that this device is too much, too much customized to the ankle joint. So if you want to expand this device to your other body, you have to design again. And also it has multiple pieces to wear and unwear. So it is not really easy to uh, use. So the next concept we had is a programmable second skin. Here, we can have a just an elastic tube, and this elastic tube has embedded actuators, small actuators. And this is a symmetric configuration, so you can easily resize and reconfigure to use this device to your knee or uh, ankle or elbow. So this is concept, and then you can have uh, simple uh, simulations like this. You can contract all the muscles at the same time. You can contract just the partial muscles at it different timing. So based on this concept, we built our own device. So this is a robot tube, elastomer tube, and hollow tube, but uh, we embedded uh, this blue and orange pneumatic muscles uh, in the structure. So when you actuate, uh, when you apply compressed air, each actuator contracts, and then it, cr it can create different mo uh, motions. The height is about 30 centimeter, and then uh, you can contract all the muscles at the same time to, stiffening, to stiffen the whole structure. Now you can control different uh, muscles at different timings, so you can have a bending effect with partial contractions. You can even do sequential contraction. So we had this result and this prototype, it uh, was exciting. But the problem here is if you make the whole structure with rubber, that is too heavy. It's, it is really heavy to your clothes or fabric. And also, it is not really skin friendly. You have to wear this device on your skin, but it's not breathable and that causes uh, some kind of skin pr troubles. So the next device we designed is a combination of this device and previous device. So in this device, uh, we built our uh, three-dimensional just leg model for test as a test bed. And then we first installed uh, fabric braces. And we, uh, we attached some hooks. And then we installed our own flat pneumatic muscles I showed it before. And now you can have a uh, much lighter device, uh, compact and lighter device, but still uh, provides actuation capability. So when you increase the compressed uh, the air pressure, it makes active uh, diff extension. When you release the gas, it goes down with the gravity. And you can also make active knee flexion. When you install these muscles uh, front and back side at the same time, you can have bidirectional actuation capability. So with really low air pressure, it can actuate uh, slightly. But when you increase the air pressure, little bit, the actuation range is much bigger. Okay, so we have this, uh, we are currently uh, thinking about uh, further improving uh, the performance and also structure of this device. And another area we also worked on is this only sensor suit without actuation. So here we have only just the sensors attached to the suit. 
no actuation. But then, when you walk around, you can detect the body shape. So that is really uh, almost the first slide, uh, the background and motivation of our soft sensors. So here we have uh, sensors at the hip joint, knee joint, and ankle joint. So when you walk and run, you can detect uh, your gait. Okay, so uh, as an ongoing work in this area, so we are currently developing uh, soft gesture de detection glove. That is kind of continuation of the body suit. So here we have a uh, uh, elastomer layer which can be co which can cover your back side of your hand, and then it has uh, multiple uh, embedded sensors. So when you move your hands around, it can detect the joint angles, and then you can detect uh, the hand gestures. So since the human hands can generate uh, really a lot of patterns, this could be used as a uh, new types of a uh, computer interface. Another area we are also working on is the soft personal ro robots. So, so we are trying to build a really low cost and lightweight personal robots like this. So it can help some uh, daily life of uh, people who have some problems of their own life. So as a test bed, we built our carbon tube carbon fiber tube, really light structures, and then 3D printed joint here. So we have two degrees of freedom here and two degrees of freedom. And uh, we will be attaching this type of a soft glove grippers at the end of this structure. And this is a preliminary vid uh, video of the device. So we installed uh, our own custom pneumatic muscles in this uh, robot arm. So it shows uh, all the degrees of freedom, and then the, the next step is to do some experiments uh, for the feedback control uh, with proportional uh, valves. We are also interested in building uh, new types of robotic hand. So this is a, a preliminary, preliminary design. You can create uh, multi-joint fingers, and then you can embed sensors in the structure, and you can add skins on the uh, robotic finger. And then you can have uh, this pinch grip and power grip uh, for the dexterous manipulation. So this is another uh, work we are currently working on. And now let's go back to uh, the first slide, the grand challenges in soft robotics. When we design our soft structures, we cannot really use, no, we cannot really use conventional, com conventional and mechanical joints and fasteners. And then, but uh, what we can do here is we can use uh, soft materials and we can get a lot of inspirations, ideas uh, from biology. And for the manufacturing process, uh, instead of using conventional machining process, we can uh, utilize additive manufacturing process, 3D printing and layered manufacturing process. And then we need to have, uh, we can do uh, integrations of these soft structures. So uh, the next s slide is almost the last slide. And in the big picture, uh, we are interested in doing research and pub uh, publishing papers, but we are not interested in just ending our uh, research just for the publication. We want to reach out to the world. Uh, what that means is uh, when I made this uh, ankle orthotic device and then it was uh, published and it, was, it looks interesting so it was featured in Discovery News and also Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and uh, New Scientist and other uh, online uh, media. And after that, I got a lot of emails and calls, and then uh, people saying, I'm a uh, stroke patient, sir. I'm a cerebral palsy patient, sir. and that, is really, uh, that looks really great, and then I want to volunteer as a uh, subject if you want to do any human test and clinical test in the future. So that was really uh, impressive and amazing for me because I was working on this project uh, as a research in the lab, but that could impact uh, a lot of people outside the world. So if we try to find out people, we can help, that'd be really uh, 
beneficial to uh, many, many people. And also, we want to have uh, more practical applications. Uh, so instead, uh, in addition to developing new sensors and new actuators, uh, the existing, existing technologies can be used uh, for some different uh, uh, applications. So that is what we are we want to do. And finally, we want to do technology trans transfer. So not just having uh, papers and patents, uh, but if we can transfer our technology to real world, uh, that is uh, really useful. And the last vi video is an example of this kind of uh, big picture uh, we made. So do we have a uh, sound here? <coughs> Yeah, I don't see the cable. I think it fell down the hole. Uh, <laughs> I would turn up your laptop really loud then. Okay, yeah, I don't know if yeah, people can hear. Here. Okay. <laughs> you just place the phone by the laptop? They don't, uh, they don't come out of here, they're just for the video. But yeah, stand near there for the folks at home. <laughs> okay. Welcome to iHITS, an individualized hand improvement and tracking system for stroke. The problem is that it is difficult to improve hand weakness after stroke. Our solution is to develop a wristband to provide individually tailored treatment to improve hand weakness. Meet Joe, who is one of the six million Americans currently living with weakness in one hand after stroke. And by 2030, 10 million more Americans will unfortunately join Joe. Like many stroke survivors, Joe's hand weakness prevents him from eating, driving, and playing ball with his son, reducing his independence in daily tasks. To regain independence in eating and other daily tasks, Joe needs to perform 300 repetitions with his weak hand every day to progressively meet his individually tailored goals. However, Joe is frustrated because he does not know how much he is moving and how well he is moving. We believe our innovative solution, iHITS, can help Joe. iHITS is an individualized hand improvement and tracking system for stroke. iHITS has an LCD display, is Bluetooth enabled, is lightweight, compact, and easy to wear during daily tasks. This is how it works. Our patented soft sensor accurately detects the wrist movement, and if the wrist movement meets the individually tailored goals, the motion will be counted as a repetition. iHITS will allow Joe to track and display the number of repetitions, sync stats wirelessly, and show trends and track improvement. This information is stored in the cloud where clinicians can access the information and periodically set new individually tailored goals. In the first five months, we will design the prototype. In the next three months, we will validate iHITS. And in the final three months, we will pilot it. We have put together a multidisciplinary team, including a rehabilitation scientist from Pitt, a clinician from Health South Hospitals, a team of engineers from Pitt and Carnegie Mellon University, and patients from the greater metro area. Together, we will bring eye hits to Joe and others' lives. Okay, yeah, as you may have guessed, uh, this is not an existing product, uh, but we want to develop this kind of product. Uh, to do this, uh, uh, in addition to developing new technologies, uh, finding new applications and new teams and new people is really important. Okay, so this is the end of uh, my presentation. I'd like to uh, thank to uh, all the collaborators and uh, also the uh, fund, uh, financial supporters uh, for these projects. Okay, thank you very much. For the nice, uh, I have a question about the capability of the sensors. So, uh, for tactile sensor or for the same sensor, mm -hmm. uh, after uh, it, it may take some time to restore the original shape of the channel, so it's instantaneous. I mean, if you after half millisecond repeat the experiment, do you get the same value? Or, or uh, yeah, that's a good question. So in polymer, we experience creep effect, uh, but we use, uh, usually use elastomer material. So that has a really uh, great capability to go back to original position. So when you first build uh, soft sensors, uh, and then the sensor signal may change uh, after a few times of stretch, but uh, that change saturates uh, to converge it to some point. So after having some training period, you can have a pretty good uh, repetition. Yes. So when you talked about adding the beads to the macro channels mm -hmm. to increase linearity, yeah. um, to what extent did that help get rid of that nasty hysteresis? 
Oh, so that in that case, uh, we didn't check the hysteresis. Uh, we checked only linearity. Okay. But hysteresis was uh, improved uh, in the cross-sectional shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just was curious. You didn't have a graph like that, and I was wondering if you tested it. Or okay, yes. Yeah, so, uh, for the bit test, uh, bit uh, case, uh, we didn't uh, check the hysteresis yet, but that is something we want to do. Okay. Yes? Um, one, one of the reasons I've always stayed away from pneumatics is, is because of the efficiency issues in uh, pumping air, mm -hmm. pumping losses, yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you thought about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is a, a very good uh, comment. Uh, so and also the comments uh, I always get. So, so I wouldn't say pneumatics is better than electromagnetic actuators and other actuators. Uh, but the reason we uh, looked at pneumatics is uh, uh, structurally it is soft. So if we have capability of man manufacturing of really small cells and multiple arrays of cells. Uh, and then we may be able to minimize the air consumption. And then we can use uh, these actuators with, with small size of air canister or small size of compressors. And also, uh, the purpose of the orthotic device and wearable device uh, in my research it was focused on rehabilitation. So people who have problems of walking, they really walk really, really slow or cannot walk. But if they can use this device, uh, that improves a little bit, that would be really useful. And also even uh, just in clinic, this device can be just a uh, sta stationary rehabilitation uh, uh, tools. Yes? Could you tell me more the size of some typical bandwidth of in such as some soft elastic center, sensors? And is it enough for the further and close control of the robot or the human? Subject. Uh, yeah, that is a good question too. So yeah, usually, yeah, pneumatic and elastic, uh, pneumatic actuators and also elastic material have a slow response time. So that may be a problem of control. But as I mentioned just uh, right now, if we use uh, patients with uh, problems of moving, so we don't really, we may not need a really high speed respons response time. So. Uh, but if you want to use this device for the normal, uh, healthy people, then there may be some problems of control. Yes? Do you know of any major limitations that would keep you from taking your sensor technology and instead of fabricating it in polymer, mm -hmm. weaving it into cloth? Uh, yeah, that is really a uh, good idea. So the reason we use polymer is it's easy to shape mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, and also easy to embed something inside. So, but that is something we also want to explore in the future. So we want to uh, embed some kind of elastic, very small fiber or tube in your fabric. So that completely hides the actuators or sensors in your uh, suit. But that is uh, kind of so, uh, something uh, which requires a, a lot of time to explore. Maybe could you elaborate on like, what the biggest challenge or two challenges are that you're going to take so long to explore that? Uh, the biggest challenge of embedding actuators in, uh, in the fabric, that is sometimes uh, it gets interfered with your motions. And also, it may, uh, the cloth makes wrinkles, and then that also may uh, interfere with the performance of the actuator or sensors. I have another question. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem.